Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline. Today, uh, joined by Dr. Michael Girardi. You may know him as the past president of ASEP. I know him as the uh, leader of the uh, New Jersey Mafia um, that, uh, that I've hung out with for, for uh, years and years and years, uh, trying to work my way in as the Kentucky representation to his organization. Um, and I uh, appreciate you joining me. And it's actually, interestingly, um, the most common time that we've seen each other other than at the national meetings has been here at a- SEC ASAP in Destin, Florida each year. And you've been coming here for years for this uh, conference as a, as a special invited outsider guest for the SEC conference. And so um, today we want to focus on, I mean, a lot of your, hit, a lot of your experience in history is actually in uh, is pediatrics and pediatric emergency medicine. But, um, you know, your talk here, uh, I thought was really nice, especially among the setting of your family as well, has been with the with elderly, um, psychiatric issues, behavioral issues, um, dementia-related issues, uh, the emergency medicine uh, presentations that are going to become more uh, are going to become more common as we see these numbers start to grow. Uh, so, talk a little bit more about those presentations and some of those considerations we need to make as emergency physicians. Well, thanks, Ryan. It's always great seeing you. I always smile when I see you because I know there's going to be some story to go home with. But uh, the uh, we talked the theme of this SEC conference this year was the extremes of age and and, and diagnoses, and. I talked about behavioral emergencies in uh, elderly patients and about agitation and whatnot. Part of the conference we talked about a lot was the growing, the tsunami on the way, which is the incredibly uh, impressive aging of our population with 10,000 people hitting 65 and qualifying for Medicare every day. So we're going to see people aging, and we're going to see many more elderly patients, and we're going to see some who have Alzheimer's or other sorts of dementia, and they're going to present unique management challenges when they show up to our emergency department. And that is a huge wave, and one of the focuses on your talk was that um, the challenges with dementia is that a lot of things are going to present um, that may be as a symbol or sign of that, but also, you know, the challenges we have in addressing and treating it, things we do that actually make the symptoms or the experience worse, and also the challenges we have with actual other physical diagnoses because of the difficulty they have in communicating those, um, and not to even mention the potential interactions with the medications we prescribe or give in the emergency department with the medication list that seem to be running pages uh, long these days. What are those challenges that we that we face with this wave of the aging population that we're going to see uh, in our emergency departments? Well, it's multifactorial. First of all, you just hit on one thing: is that some people carry a psychiatric diagnosis as a younger adult, which they will carry over and will get worse, or maybe be quiescent when they get into their dementia stages. But other people have dementia symptoms that are sometimes confused as psychiatric symptoms. In fact, the natural progression of the disease creates agitation, uh, confusion, uh, psychosis with hallucinations, etc., which people will try to attribute a primary psychiatric diagnosis when, in fact, it's just a progression or symptom of the underlying dementia. And therefore, they're called a diagnostic psychiatric metaphor. In other words, it's not a primary psychiatric diagnosis. Rather, it's a symptom of the dementia. And therefore, they have to be treated differently. I think that you just alluded to just the presentation. People with uh, advanced stage dementia cannot express themselves, especially what's hurting them, for instance, or what their discomfort is, or why they're agitated, or why they're not, they're out of sorts. You know, that common complaints sent from a skilled nursing facility or even home. They're just not themselves. Okay, so now your differential is quite lengthy, and you have to worry about things such as trauma, intracranial bleed. You have to worry about metabolic causes. You have to worry about infectious causes. But sometimes it's an exacerbation caused by uh, a new medication that's been added. Polypharmacy, as you know, is a big problem in the United States, especially for the elderly. It could be um, a change in environment for that person. It's very distressing for people with dementia to be put in a new environment or new noises and new people. And it's, um, it's got to be, t- you have to take a holistic approach when you're dealing with the agitated Alzheimer's patient, other dementia patients. In other words, look at the entire environment and situation when you're trying to figure out what's different or what's caused the deterioration of in, the, in, the recent, in the recent past. I mean, I don't know how they did it with uh, 
a lot of these patients before EMRs, you know, with without them being able to give us information or, you know, that mean this population more than anybody else, the old history, which tends to be, you know, at least up to date recent visits, not somebody who was last seen six years ago, um, seems to be invaluable in terms of getting that data because they can't, you know, can't necessarily voice their problems, or they may accidentally omit a significant problem like a uh, like a AAA or something like that that they don't think about. Um, but also then medications, dosing, timing. You know, the potential that they did with polypharmacy is the medications themselves interacting, or the potential that what I see very often is did they take too much of it on accident, or has there been an issue such as acute renal insufficiency that is causing stacking of the medications and thus side effects from that, such as your blood pressure medications that are now now not being cleared as fast. And so the patient comes in hypotensive or orthostatic and bradycardic. And, you know, putting all those things can be very difficult. What are some of the things we can do as emergency physicians to, one, maximize our performance, out, our outcomes for our patients, but also to help the patient themselves who comes in and may, be, may have some dementia or agitation when they come into the emergency department. You, you mentioned several things that, that you have uh, adopted yourself in order to help with that actual interaction and the time the patient is in that setting. Well, they always say when bad things occur in both in relationships and in the emergency departments, a communication problem. And we are going into an era now with uh, electronic, medical, electronic medical record and where we can access the records, that's going to be a big uh, enhancement to our ability to treat these patients. I think emergency department information exchanges, regional exchanges, we have to really promote them as a college, and uh, ASEP does, and we're seeing more states setting up these exchanges where you can download recent discharge summaries, recent testing, et cetera. More importantly, though, is getting a history from the, the, the skilled f- nursing facility or these, the family members, what is... Mr. and Mrs. Jones's baseline. Tell me a little bit more about them. Uh, after my talk this morning, one of the physicians came up to me and said, I got tearful because it reminded me of my dad, who was a boxer in the Navy. And he said when he reverted back to the, his deeper layers of his psyche from his earlier youth, his way to deal with stress was to take a, bon- a boxer stance, and that would be considered threatening. But he was a gentle man who just was a Golden Gloves fighter in the Navy. And so you revert back to things that you were felt comfortable with. He's not, and he was a pleasant man. But uh, these are things that wouldn't be understood by medical personnel. So you have to figure out where do the, where's that person coming from? How do they act? And what's their, what are the triggers? Uh, not to use a politically correct room like triggers, but what are the things that could provoke them to be irritated? Some people don't like being touched. Some people don't like being moved around a lot. Some people don't like loud noises. And these things can all trigger, uh, uh, lower the threshold to get an agitated state. By the way, the comorbidities, again, and the underlying disease processes are very important. We talked about this, um, in the, this morning about ischemic heart disease or ischemic uh, profound vascular disease can cause ischemic uh, changes, et cetera, which makes them prone to lower blood pressure or medication changes. And the progression could be at different rates. That's another frustration. What is the trajectory for your family member or your patient. Is this a rapid one or has it been fairly gradual or stable? And that's going to affect your differential diagnosis as you try to tackle that problem. I I can go on and on, but I think you've hit on them. I think comorbidities, medications, their baseline status, their environment they're in. And we talked about this this morning as well, is that the environment and looking for some kind of respite care for the caregivers who sometimes are just 24 hours on and they have no no, no break. It can really wear out the caretaker, and it puts both the patient and the caretaker at risk for a lot of uh, bad things to happen because of fatigue. And everyone knows that we make more mistakes, and we're not on our game when we have been sleep deprived or under a great deal of, deal of stress. Both the patient again and the caretakers. One of the things I took away from your talk um, was, you know, making sure, and you actually just touched on a little bit, is being able to approach the patient where they are. Um, you know, we, we approach patients many times trying to get them to understand us, but at the same time, if this patient is reverting back, like you were talking about, you know, they may be reverting back to, um, and we see it all the time, that, that whether it's a Vietnam veteran that's, that's reverting back to Vietnam or somebody they're old and old, you know, their younger days as a boxer, or, you know, you talked about music and things like that and meeting them at that space and not trying necessarily to correct them and fix that because you're not going to, um, you know, you're not going to fix the dementia. It's, it's help relating with them. Um, and you mentioned the music and you mentioned 
you know, learning their story. And I, th- I find that that's very beneficial. Let them, start, let them start telling their story. And if they start telling their story, they calm down and relate to you better because I think they're more comfortable and they know that, that you care. So just sitting down and listening to the story, I still remember um, a, a demented uh, patient at the uh, Veterans Administration when I was a medical student wanting to tell me all about Seymour. Um, and Seymour was where he said he was from, and honestly, it was actually an, an analogy um, because he said, "When you go someplace, you see more." And but he actually told me this 45-minute story about his life, and up to that point, he had been just what you would consider an old grumpy codger um, that that you that you didn't want to go near. But when he told the story, um, you know, it, it changed him completely because he was able to share himself and kind of put you where he was as opposed to what we try to do in medicine, which is try to pull them into us. And so, you know, other things being decreasing the the stimulation within the hospital, the ER, uh, the noises, the lights, the, the, uh, I mentioned the sounds already, Um, you know, the consideration you said, you, you know, with your residents, if you're going to start a medication on somebody over 75, you better have a dang good reason and actually review everything, knowing how all of those things are going to play together. Um, it's not as easy as a young person where you can slap them with a bunch of medicines real quick, and it's a really good chance they're just going to clear them and not have any issue. That's not necessarily the case with their elderly populations. And then towards the end of the talk, you also talked about one of the big issues that we're facing now in emergency medicine. Um, you know, and, and this it translates over because many times these the dementia patient, the elderly patient, falls into that behavioral health um, evaluation. A lot of times, the long-term care facilities are within a psychiatric type setting, and um, one of the big challenges we've had in emergency medicine that ASEP has taken on has been the psychiatric uh, issues, and um, I don't know, it's what what the, the I mean, I don't, know, just, I don't I even know what, how to phrase it. Behavioral health crisis. The behavioral health crisis in the United States has become uh, such a huge his- issue. And, you know, and, and you guys, and when you were president, I know you, you guys went in and started, you know, the process of really getting involved because emergency medicine has to take the problem by the horns because we may not be the definitive care, but we are the probably the primary source or site for acute care evaluation, stabilization, and disposition. So talk, give us a little bit more about that and what you guys have been doing and what we can expect. Well, one of the problems with dealing with these behavioral emergencies is really finding the resources to help get the follow-up or to to try a new intervention or intervention or environment. And you need coordination of care for that. And by default, emergency medicine usually assumes the responsibilities for those services which are lacking. Once again, the safety net is not only a safety net, it's getting interwoven with even more cables because we have a bigger mission. And this mission now is how to get people in the right place care environment at the right time. And I think that the resources are lacking with the growing population and lack the, the, the difficulty in getting people into long-term care with the three-day admission required by Medicare and these kind of rules, we're stuck with uh, really trying to make dispositions that are very difficult. That aside, behavioral emergencies are a burgeoning crisis in the United States for patients of all ages. And we what we did was create a coalition on psychiatric emergencies, CPE. And we have uh, the American Academy of Emergency Psychiatry participating, NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness, which is a patient-focused organization, et cetera, and Emergency Nurses Association, American Psychiatric Association. And we been meet, have been meeting since December 2014. We have a research agenda, an advocacy agenda, policy boarding agenda, and, um, and an educational agenda. So what we're trying to do is ed- educate patients. Patients are going to educate us about what they prefer to have happen to them in an acute care setting. Psychiatrists are going to learn from us how to do a a medical stabilization without requiring necessarily an ED visit. And likewise, we're going to start initiating treatment more quickly in the ED rather than waiting for a psychiatrist to fully evaluate the patient. In other words, it's going to be a, a team approach It's going to create greater efficiencies of care, uh, more appropriate and humane care, so we can initiate treatment and placement in a much more efficient manner to decrease uh, the burden on these patients when they're in crisis of all ages. And that includes the agitated elderly patient. Interestingly, though, were you expecting the vacuum you found when you got into this? Because one of the showing the list of of charge items that you guys um, came up with 
the big one is one of the big ones was the research, the research component of it. And I think there's a lot of research on individual diagnoses, but I think there's there's probably a paucity of uh, of research on the emergency medicine side, the approach side, the transition of care side, um, the setting side. And I mean, we're seeing it with. Uh, with substance abuse being in the area of the country where we have so much substance abuse, so um, you, you would just create a re we did a we created a research consensus conference in December with the uh, uh, new updates in behavioral emergencies conference and we, Mike Wilson, Dr. Mike Wilson, ASAP member, a really prominent researcher in this area, helped drive a consensus conference and we came up with. Uh, four major areas that we're working on. We created a research agenda, and if anybody's interested in this area, the, it's wide open. I mean, the questions such as, what's the most effective medication to use if you decide to use one on an elderly patient with acute agitation? Or should you even use medication at all? Should you use physical restraints or just put them in a quiet room? These answers have to be definitively answered so we have a better approach to these patients. As you said, the I just showed one slide up there of five I could have shown on the list of items that are open items that we don't know the answers to. So you know that we've got a whole, young researchers out there, if you're out there, there are, there's a whole career waiting for you just to help. And this document, by the way, will be published in the next few months, we hope. And uh, you, people can contact me and I'll be happy to share with them some preliminary uh, results on what the agenda will be from research. And not only that, but we, we, we're attacking acute psychosis, we're attacking uh, substance abuse, et cetera, because these all inter interact with um, intersect with the behavioral emergencies type problem. Interestingly, you know, we get strokes. We have time measures on strokes and heart attacks, or MI, um, and all of those sorts of things. And yet, you know, there's many areas of the country uh, that our physicians and teams are dealing with um, boarding times for psychiatric patients, behavioral health patients in, that are measured in days, if not, you know, weeks. Um, and that's not good for our physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nursing staffs, uh, for our facility in general. And it's really not fair and, and um, detrimental to our patients because they're not at the site for the care that they need in an environment that is many times detrimental to their stabilization when you come to uh, agitated states, whether that's elderly or otherwise. You know, the emergency room is not the best place to decrease stimulation. Two of my uh, favorite colleagues in this, this space are emergency psychiatrists. One is named Scott Zeller from California who created the Almeida model, and Kim Nordstrom, who's the past president of the American Academy of Emergency Psychiatry. And they point out to me, and they say it very eloquently, People in, uh, with acute cri uh, mental health decompensation are in crisis. It's just like having a broken arm. It causes a lot of mental pain and distress. And I think it's inhumane what we've been doing with our psychiatric behavioral health patients. The lack of resources, the fact that we don't um, have proper places to treat them. We have children boarding in my ED for several days waiting for placement. Um, I think that's just not the way anybody would want to be treated in, in that environment. What we're learning, though, with this coalition is are, is that there are models being developed that create really viable and very desirable alternatives to that type of, of a process for a psychiatric patient. And you mentioned studying times. I mean, down here at the SEC meeting, Southeastern Chapters, I learned of a study that Tennessee had just completed with the Mental Health Association and Tennessee Hospital Association, Sully Sullivan and uh, uh, S Sandy um, Herman work with the state and the state hospital association, and they have data showing how wait times for bed placement have been increasing, number of beds for psychiatric patients have been decreasing. But what they did is they started creating a blueprint or model for how you have standing orders and initiate treatment and an agreed upon mental, uh, medical screening exams to facilitate transport to the right places and or discharge. Uh, between that and the Alameda model, and there's some models in Michigan being done I've learned about, I think we're going to be able to give our emergency physicians out there some viable models to try to replicate in their own environments in, in the very near future, within a year or two. And we're going to, that's one of the things the coalition's working on to disseminate this. I'll tell you, though, that with the aging population, the answers aren't as are going to be more difficult because of their comorbidities and their medical problems. But that's one of the reasons we set up the um, research consensus conference that Dr. Wilson organized. That's one of the four top agenda items that they address, especially, and if we can't get the answers, at least we can decide maybe we can find some interim solutions, even though we don't have the definitive answers. Dr. Girardi, it's always awesome to see you, especially down here uh, in Destin, Florida. I always looked forward to it. And uh, 
give folks uh, ways that they can, if they have questions, want to get in contact with you, um, an email address, and then uh, social media as well. Okay, mgerardi at asep.org. So my first initial, M-G-E-R-A-R-D-I at asep.org. I am on Facebook as Michael J. Girardi. I do have a Twitter account. I forgot the name. For, darn it, I'm a big t- uh, tweet, uh, Twitter fan. <laughs> I, use, I don't use it often. And my uh, phone number, 973-464-3351, 973-464-3351. I would love to hear from you if you want to get involved with the coalition. We have plenty of room to take. I've already had two people come up to me in the last half hour want to participate after hearing some of the things we're doing. So we welcome you. And I appreciate it, and I look forward to, to some changes. I'm fortunate in Kentucky that we've, we don't have the resources we need, but we also don't have some of the challenges that some of the folks, you know, when you're hearing about people in the ER for days and days and weeks and months, and, uh, and fortunately I haven't had to deal with that yet, but it's a challenge that we need, to, we need to take on in order to advocate for our patients and honestly an at-risk population, whether it's uh, of any age, um, the behavioral health associated uh, crises and diagnoses and, and presentations to the emergency room, we need to advocate because they are an at-risk population. Um, and, and we are there to take care of them, but we need, we need ways to uh, move that uh, pendulum uh, to the next step to get that patient the care that they really need in order to get uh, the best outcomes they can get and get back to their own lives. As for me, you can. Uh, I, and I really hope you guys like our Facebook uh, page. The ASAP Frontline is also also. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you're getting every episode. You're going to get 52 uh, a year. And you can also contact me at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. And if I can't answer the question, I will uh, get it to those that, uh, that can give you the answers you need. Ryan, thank you for everything you're doing for the specialty with all your media out, outreach and your podcasts and your spoke, your spokesperson for the college. Kudos to you. Well, I appreciate it. It's my way, uh, the way I've always felt of these podcasts. It's, it's my way of learning, and I just put it out there so hopefully other people can uh, find things interesting that I want to learn about. Um, and so uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, and as for me, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Frontline.